Welcome to episode 299 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr with a bit of a raspy voice today. Don't worry everybody, I recorded this week's episode before I started losing my voice. Anyway, what's the topic of this week's episode? Ah, how green is out of home delivery? It's probably a question you've asked yourself from time to time. How green is it? Well, I've invited Assistant Professor Paul Burse from the Department of Operations at the University of Groningen on the podcast to talk about this very thing. He has co-authored some research on the topic of the relative environmental merits of -of out-of-home delivery. So, coming up in just a moment, Paul Burse is going to give us all the answers. Maybe. (laughs) We'll see. You have to keep listening to find out. I'm not going to tell you in the introduction, am I? Joining me on the line is Paul Burse. Paul is Assistant Professor in the Department of Operations at the University of Groningen. And Paul, we're going to talk about uh, a paper that you co-authored. The title is A Greener Last Mile, Reviewing the Carbon Emission Impact of Pickup Points in last mile parcel delivery. Now that's there's a lot packed into that one title, <laughs> isn't there, Paul? When you talk about pickup points, though, what we we're talking about what other people call hours of home delivery, so pudos and parcel lockers and things like that. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, basically everything where the alternative of home delivery is in place, so a delivery in a parcel locker or a pickup point in the shop. Yeah. Anything like that. So tell us, how does an out-of-home delivery network improve, well, sorry, I should rephrase that, from your research, what did you find that says that, that or, or does even an out-of-home delivery network improve the efficiency of delivery routes? Well, the simplest explanation is that by having out-of-home deliveries, each out-of-home delivery is one home address less to be visited, right? And from our research, we we modeled, uh, together with Rudy Niemeyer, the co-author, we modeled a um, single delivery route. And in that delivery route, if you have 10% of the people going for out-of-home delivery, the route length decreases by 5%. If it's 30% of the people going for out-of-home delivery, it's 15% shorter route and so on and so forth. So that's the simplest part. So just every uh, out-of-home address is one home address less to be delivered. We can also look at it in, in a bit more complex way in which pickup points can improve the efficiency of routes. But then we need to look at multiple vehicles and, and also at their operating time. So, and then it's important to realize actually that delivery vehicles don't drive all that much, right? So if you have a typical eight hour shift, about 120 addresses to two minutes per home address stopping, the vehicle is parked for four hours, right? Which is half, which is half the shift. So, uh, and actually stop time can be much longer than two minutes. So we did some research ourselves with cargo bikes and then it was two minutes and 15 seconds, but those were cargo bikes, which are nimble and can park anywhere. And actually, if you look at the research from the group of Anne Goodchild in Seattle, they did this study where they showed that finding a parking spot alone can take one hour out of the eight-hour driving shift <laughs> of a delivery van, right? So, so two yeah. minutes is conservative, and then even the, the vehicle is standing parked for half, half the shift. So the result is actually that the li- delivery vehicles are then often constrained by time and not by, by volume or weight capacity. And by having out-of-home delivery, you can improve the load factor if... Uh, out-of-home delivery reduces the time you need to stop per delivery, right? And that can be done because you reduce filled deliveries. So uh, you you save the time standing in front of someone's door that's actually not at home. And by grouping deliveries uh, from from multiple addresses at a single pickup point, yeah, you reduce the time. Again, to conclude, if, if you do a very simple example, right? You have an inner city, typical inner city in Europe, 700 deliveries in a shift. Um, two and a half minutes stop time because it's a city and it takes a bit more time to find a a parking spot. You would require typically five vehicles driving a bit over 200 kilometers. If then uh, you are able to reduce the average stop time to two minutes, so by 30 seconds, you can cut out a complete vehicle. So you only need four vehicles that then drive 175 kilometers, which is a considerable gain, right? So that's the somewhat longer answer to uh, out-of-home delivery network can uh, improve the efficiency of routes. One of the, th- whenever you talk about the efficiency, whether it's the emissions efficiency or otherwise of 
out of home delivery networks, the question is always raised, well, how does the customer collect the parcel? And how can you measure that? So when you talk, when, when we're talking about customers collecting from out of home delivery points, whether it's, as we said, a locker or a pickup drop off point or whatever it might be, how can you measure the carbon emissions generated by the customer? Yeah, so you can you can go over that in many ways. Basically, in our study, what we did is we were able to obtain a, a large data set of 50,000 or even a bit more than 50,000 customer trips to pick up points in the Netherlands, right? So all over the Netherlands, and it, the, the data was uh, provided to us by one of the largest postal companies uh, in, in the Netherlands. And that data included travel mode choice. So that is, uh, if a customer went to a pick a point, whether the customer did so on foot or a bike or on car, and if, if a customer goes on foot or by bike, we assume zero emissions, right? But if the car is taken, we simply multiply the distance they traveled with, uh, with the average carbon emissions of a, of a passenger car. But you can make this as complex as you want, of course, right? But, but in our study, that's, that's the way we, we went about. Yeah, it's a good point. You can make it as complex as you want. But at some point, we have to sort of make, I suppose, base any decisions you make on some assumptions. But when it comes to the consumer's decision-making, how do consumers or what have you observed about consumers choosing the means of transport they use to collect parcels? Yeah, so many things, actually. That's the, the nice part of having such a big data set from practice, right? So we, we've seen all the, 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 the individual travels. And if we just look at the data set as a whole, we saw that 54% of people took the car. Or actually, I should say, 54% of the distance traveled by customers was done by, by their car. 30% by bike. The Netherlands, yeah, and uh, 16% on foot. So that's the that's when you look at the overall. But but these were customers that were living anywhere in the Netherlands, right? With, with the closest pickup point being, yeah, very diverse depending on where you live. So we we basically dissected this data set in all possible ways we could, and one of the ways we did it was by looking at trips of different lengths. So for trips that are shorter than 200 meters, for example, so really, really short trips. If the pickup point is basically almost next door, 90% of the customers go on foot and only super few people take the car, right? So so that's all nice. But as the distance increases of the trip to the pickup point, you see the car use in, increases rapidly. So already at six or 800 meters distance, a whooping 20% of the distance traveled is done by car, right? Which is that doesn't seem like very much. I mean, as in the distance seems quite short for people to be selecting the car. Indeed, indeed. And what actually, when you break it a bit down, also in, in people that come from rural areas or suburban areas and, and, and urban areas, you do see that in, in urban areas, there's a bit more leeway. So in urban areas, people don't even own a car usually, right? Especially in student cities like, like Groningen or Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Yeah, then you see that more people will will not take their car, right? And you can go up to maybe even a kilometer, but but on average, it's way less. And and indeed, in, in rural areas, people are more accustomed to taking their car anyway, right? So we also saw that divide between uh, rural customers and, and and densely urban customers. And just, just on that then, is it in part the thinking is ingrained in the consumer? They think naturally, well, if it's such and such a distance... No, that's not actually, they're not making that calculation in their mind. It's just what they do. If I go to the shops, I go in the car. If I'm going into town, because I'm a rural, I live in a rural area, I take the car. So it's just naturally follows that when it comes to collecting a parcel, they're following the same sort of thought process. Would that be right? Yeah, so I can imagine, right? So this is not a, the research we did. So if we stick to the data, we simply looked at, well, we cut the trips in, in buckets of 200 meters uh, in increasing length to the parcel point. Yeah, then, then this is what we see. And um, what we did see also is uh, like uh, uh, combining the trip, right? So combining the trip to the pickup point with some other. Uh, so you, you just mentioned the rural people, a person living in a rural area going to the shop and maybe it's possible to combine uh, a trip to the pickup point with a trip to the shop. We actually did look at that. So in the data, we only considered it, this for people travel by car. Because if you travel on bike and foot, you are anyway zero emission, right? So we, we looked at people traveling by car and we asked them, okay, if you went to the pickup point, did you also do something else in that same trip? And, and a bit over half, actually 57% of the people did, right? So, so a bit over half the people combined it. And, and what we did in our analysis then, very, we were very generous. And then we just said, okay, we, we assume that those kilometers all are also zero emission because we are not able to determine 
like how much, if any, extra distance was traveled to get to the pickup point, right? So we simply nullified the whole trip in terms of carbon emissions uh, for our further analyses. I suppose in part you could also argue that the trip was happening because of the other reason. Indeed. <laughs> the trip was happening because you're going to the shops rather than to collect the parcel. Indeed. And Indeed. You'll wait until you go to the shops to collect the parcel. I'm sure people listening to this can uh, you know, add their own f- you know, flavor to that thinking. But um, as you said, Paul, we'll, we'll stick to the research <laughs> rather than me going off and con- making conjectures. Making conjectures? Conjecturing? You all know what I mean. Getting back to your research then, Paul, how can pickup points become a viable means to reduce emissions? Yeah, so we can look at it, this basically in two, I think in two ways. So first, a bit more conceptually, right? We, we, we look at this as a tug of war, if you will, right? So with on one side of the rope pulling the efficiency gains of the delivery vehicle, right? If you have, like I said, if you have 10% uh, adoption, you already have a 5% shorter route, hence efficiency gain, hence uh, emission reduction. So that's positive. And at the other side of the rope is the customers that if they take a polluting car to the pickup point, they emit, right? And then looking at that tug of war, typically if you have a typical route, pickup points will not reduce emissions when 13% of customer travel is done by car. So that's not a lot. Huh? So we just said 54% in our overall data set was done by car. That is way too much. So 13% is, is the maximum if you look at our analysis. So that's the, the drive facts, right? So if you're, then a, if you're then a postal company or a delivery company and you, you want to ensure that including pickup points are a sustainable means, right? We advise basically to have a, a, a network that is as dense as possible where you basically ensure that the distance for any customer is so short that they will automatically go on foot or by bike. And, and our, our data suggests it should not be much more than 350, maybe 400 meters yeah, for, for anyone in a network so that maximum 13% of the customer travel is done by car. And that sounds pretty close to the, the famous slipper distance that we've heard from our friends at B-Post in the past. Yeah, and actually it was interesting. So I spoke with them about this, right? And we did this research independently, or we did the research. They, they did their EcoZone in Mechelen. And basically uh, they, they analyzed this from practice, we with a bunch of math, and we came to more or less the same conclusion. So I think they went for, for even, a bit, even a bit denser network, but yeah. Now, we, we did talk about trip chaining just before. And just for people saying, hang on, what's trip chaining? Trip chaining is where, as part, well, could you, def- can, is there a proper definition for trip chaining, Paul? Well, I think the intuitive definition would be that you make a chain of trips, right? Where uh, one trip is, uh, you do multiple things in a single trip, basically. Going shopping, dropping up your kids, and going to the pickup point all in one trip. Yeah. So don't drop off your kids at the pickup point, of course. You're dropping off the kids at the school <laughs> and picking up from the pickup point. So are there, are there any other observations you can share on this? I mean, it's really interesting what you're saying about you know, the methodology used in terms of calculating the emissions impact of you know, a shared voyage. Is there anything else that you can, you can share with us with, when it comes to trip chaining? Actually, one, one, this is one of the limitations of our study. So at least we, we were able to observe that if a car trip was made, whether it was part of a trip, right? And, and, in, and before we did some pilot tests with, uh, where, where Rudy Niemeyer actually did all sorts of pilot survey questions and, and uh, Google Maps integrations to identify any potential extra distance. Huh? Because sometimes the trip requires a bit of a detour to go to, to the pickup point, even if it's a chain, right? And then basically that was... There were too many options, right? So, so yeah, m- customers do all sorts of things going to the pickup point. They drop off their kids or, or they go to the shop or they go to their sports. Or, and then sometimes it's three, four, five, six different things. Sometimes there's zero detour. Sometimes there's a lot of detouring, right? So basically, based on those pilot tests of our survey, we said, let's, let's not go for that and be super generous in favor of sustainability impact of, of pickup points, right? And just simply say, if someone trip chains, we assume uh, zero CO2 to be allocated to the pickup point trip. And one thing we haven't really mentioned in all of this is the role of electric vehicles. You've talked about walking and cargo bikes, but obviously we're seeing delivery companies, whether they're postal operators or private operators, increasingly add electric vehicles to their fleet. And 
there are also more consumers using electric vehicles as well. Um, how did that fit into your research? So currently, basically, we, we assume average passenger car carbon emissions and av- average delivery vehicle emissions, right? So we just take the, the usual vehicle on, on both sides. But in principle, our model is completely free in that you can put any carbon emission per kilometer travel by either the delivery vehicle or, or, the, or the passenger car, right? So if more people adopt electric vehicles, you can reduce the average emission per kilometer driven by the passenger car and likewise on, on the delivery vehicle side. Now, generally, we see that delivery companies are electrifying their fleets at rapid pace now. So, so in, at least in the Netherlands, you see whole uh, fleets just being replaced, uh, diesel vans, uh, by, by electric vans. And this goes at a much faster pace than customers do adopt electric cars, right? So in general, when you look at our analysis, at this intermediary stage where the passenger cars are still mostly gasoline, right? And the, and the delivery vehicles increasingly become electric. Yeah, this tug of war ch- changes basically, right? The, 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 the power that the, that the delivery company has reduces because anyway, they become less emitting when they're delivering their parcels with, with an electric truck, right? So the gains of the pickup point become less and less. And at the other end, you still have the customers mostly having uh, gasoline cars. So their relative power on the rope in this tug of war becomes more. So basically, yeah, it becomes harder for pickup points to be a sustainable uh, means of transportation. Now, when we're talking about emissions, just to clarify, we're talking about tailpipe emissions here. It's not that yes. we are taking into account the manufacture of the Indeed. vehicle and all those sorts of things. Indeed. And and it's important to also realize that we are just looking at CO2 emissions, right? So t- tailpipe CO2. So there's uh, people are frustrated with delivery vans for for all sorts of reasons, actually other than CO2 as well, right? So congestion, traffic, safety, and so on. Right, and and we didn't look at that. But again, if we go to my very first simple analysis of a typical delivery route, you will have in any given street more than one stop usually. Right, so you need an extremely high adoption rate of pickup points for vehicles to actually no longer go through any given street in a city. So sometimes I feel people look at this a bit naively, if I may say so, right? So, so even if we have all these pickup points, still vehicles will go through most streets, right? Even if, if the delivery company is able to improve the efficiency of, of its delivery routes by means of, of pickup points. So and we didn't look at that, right? So we, indeed, we only look at, at tailpipe emissions. And actually, currently, uh, together with my, my research team, we are, we are doing a much broader analysis, not just of delivery points, but of last mile delivery systems in general, and look at complete emissions, so the total life cycle assessment. But that's that's still in the making, that research, right? But then we actually go much beyond the tailpipe uh, emissions. And, and that sounds like a really interesting project. And I think that we'll all be interested to find out some of the outcomes from that. One of the things you sort of just, just touched on, though, when you're talking about, you know, we'll still have vans in the street, as even though if there is increasing adoption. But are we talking about... a adoption of puto points or sorry i should say adoption of hours of home delivery from a consumer perspective that is that the consumers have to elect to use out of home delivery and it's the so it's effectively the consumer driving does that make sense what i just said yeah so when i'm talking about adoption that's what i'm talking about right so in by by any means so it can also be delivery companies that stop coming for a second time after a failed attempt right so they they try one time and the second time you go to to pick a point it can be consumers increasingly opt for it but by any means right i think that you would need an adoption way above 50% yeah? so 50% of all consumers opting for out of home right. delivery for a vehicle not to pass any given street in in a in a typical city. Paul, we've covered a lot and there's a lot for people to chew on there. If anyone wants to find out more about the work that you and the team are doing or any of the research projects you're involved in, where should they go? Well, I'm always uh, reachable by email or or via LinkedIn, right? So we're doing a a lot of uh, projects usually and we are interested especially to work with uh, with your audience, right? So with, with people that have delivering parcels at, as their daily operation, so they can reach out by any means possible. And uh, as I said, we'll be working mostly on uh, on last mile delivery networks from a larger life cycle assessment view, but also from an operational and an economic perspective. 
So yeah, I'm always happy to to have a chat. I'll put a link to Paul's LinkedIn profile as well as a link to the university website, some part of it that's relevant. Anyway, if you go to thepostalhub.com, look for the episode page relating to this episode and you'll find the details there. Paul Burris, Assistant Professor at the Department of Operations in or at, I should say, the University of Groningen. Thank you very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. Thanks for having me in. This was great. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, we've got Tammy Whitcomb-Hull, the Inspector General, the USPS Inspector General. She'll be joining us. Um, We've got David Spottiswood uh, from Hurricane, and he'll be joined by Cyril McGrain from Unpost. Another really interesting discussion, that one. Uh, Charles Brewer, the CEO of Pos Malaysia. He's going to be turning up. Um, Johan Peters, the sustainability, the urban sustainability expert. He's coming back. Um, who else? Anne Snitko from Omnic. She's coming back. And somebody else. His name eludes me at the moment. <laughs> He'll be joining us too. In the coming weeks, make sure you don't miss any of these episodes because they're all great. I know I'm going to say that, of course, but I think they're great and I think they're worth listening to. And if you want to do that, and as in listen to it, and make sure you listen to it, subscribe to the podcast in your favourite podcast platform, number one. Number two, subscribe to my email newsletter. Go to thepostalhub.com and you'll find the details there. Um, what else should you do? Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Subscribe to the Daily Delivery Digest. Subscribe to the Decarbonising Delivery Newsletter, right, which you definitely should do. And email me, ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in. And I look forward to your company next time when my voice comes back on the Postal Hub podcast.